Hello, Charlie TCG here. And welcome back to Looking Ahead, a series where I break down and analyze the meta, what's happening over Japan, and how will it impact Taiwan. And today, we're breaking down all things Twilight Masquerade and exactly what are the top decks which are performing really well in Japan. From that, we're going to break down exactly, look at the meta percentage, look at the decks which have kind of got the most sort of placement in top 16, plus followed by exactly what was the best performing deck over the last few weekends at the Champions League, as well as also looking at some of the top placing lists. Look at exactly some of my thoughts and feelings break it down to kind of exactly talk about where I think some of these decks will really impact our sort of meta at Twilight Masquerade's only released next week, which is honestly crazy that we're going to get this kind of like Dragapult dominated format very, very soon. So right now we're going to break down the City League Championship through results that happened a few weekends ago. The reason why I'm saying this now, because City Leagues have now kind of gone a little bit on a hiatus break because the format has now officially finished for the season. We can see here it definitely changed quite a lot. Now, a few things you may notice here is Maridon has absolutely miraculously shot up to 11.8%. Why is this? Well, it obviously won the Champions League a few weekends ago, so people are going to be playing Maridon and very, very similar to the winning list, and it did incredibly well, because I do think it has a very, very positive um, Dragapult matchup. Dragapult is very difficult for them to get these big one-hit KOs on you, because you've got 220 HP and they attack obviously for 200 damage. Yes, they can do some sprinkle damage, but you're all very, very high HP basic Pokemon. And your support Pokemon have over 60 HP, like Tatsuguri has 70. So that's definitely a huge um, swing in favor of Maridon. Dragapult definitely decreased this number to 20.5%. It's still very, very high. I definitely have been noticing a lot of people talk about Dragapult and how powerful it really is. And they still are trying to decide the right partner. But after the top four placement with the Zarty build, I still think that's definitely a lot more favorite. And we've got to break down exactly some other builds of Dragapult later on. Luki has definitely round up a little bit of by nearly 50%, so it's also Lost Tina. These two decks are doing incredibly well in this new format. Lost Tina has definitely adopted the likes of having the um, Blood Moon, Blood Moon Ursa Luna, which I actually think is a very good inclusion, because obviously Iron Leaves is very powerful into Charizard, but if Charizard meta is kind of shifting a little bit lower, as so we can see it's 6.8%, which is insanely low for the way we've normally seen. Blood Moon Ursa Luna offers a very good attacker in the late game. When your opponent potentially has taken five prizes, you can swing for 240 damage or 300... 260 HP Pokemon for zero energies. Plus, Lukia definitely going to be more favored to the one definitely got top four. No Wellspring Ogre Pond, but definitely focusing on more of the Iron Hands and utilizing the um the Lumin the, the Legacy Energy multiple times from having the attacking of like Luminion, shuffling that back into their deck. Another big increase is Gardevoir gain 6.1%. Also, I want to say thank you so much for support on the Gardevoir video. It really does mean a lot to me. And obviously, definitely after doing a bit of testing myself after the event, I've definitely noticed that Monkey Dory is definitely a very good inclusion to Gardevoir. I'm going to break down exactly my feelings about that very, very soon. But we can also see some other changes. There is no Shen Pao. Shen Pao, I think, right now in the rest of the game is very, very horrible because kind of an optimal Frigibax and 70 HP and they have two retreats, so it always becomes a much, much worse as a starter option. But Raging Bolt has made the graphic at 3.8%, nearly actually got into the top um, six best performing Dark types and they outplacing Charizard, but it did get, didn't get as many second places. But this team of Ogre Point is actually a really, really powerful deck. Obviously, Ogre Pond is really, really strong, and we're going to talk about it a bit later. With the Grass one, which gets you attach energy from your hand to Ogre Pond and draw one card. So it instantly becomes a little bit better than the likes of Sandy Shocks. So I think Raging Bolt actually could be pretty well placed. Then we've seen Blissey actually do really well. It got quite a nice showing on the Champions League. So of course, it's going to do really well in the City League. So it's also Golden Go and likes of Greninja. But so that was exactly the last few um, City League Championships that happened this season. How exactly does all of this Twilight Mask Grade format actually look? Well, if it kind of like shifts it up just a little bit, we can see some decks that will return because there's a lot more results. And Dragapult is definitely that nearly that 25% meta share, be 23.8, which is obviously very, very powerful. Dragapult is still, I would say, quite a new archetype. We don't really understand how, what the best version is. We get the um, Japan Championships pretty nationals basically pretty much a week before any IC. So we're gonna see a little bit more about where people are gonna go at with our Dragapult. Right now I definitely think the Invisati build is probably my personal favorite one to play. The Charizard one is obviously really, really strong because you have an amazing late game attacker and actually can get these big one hit KO possibilities. But I would definitely say with um the Zarty build it's probably much stronger and the Lost in build definitely kind of like favored out just a little bit. Luka being at nearly 15%, 14.2 is definitely, again, this is the decks which you should really be concerned about. Luka becomes much stronger. And I honestly think it's a very, very strong pick now for the rest of the format, even in going into Worlds. I know that's very, very far away, but again, we're not getting that much of a change of the format. So Luka is doing incredibly well right now. Legacy only really, really does open up a deck so much. 
Lostina, however, is also doing really well. It's overtaken the likes of Charizard. Why on earth is that? I mentioned before, like, if Charizard isn't going as strong, you can remove the likes of Iron Leaves, and all of a sudden, now you've just got the likes of um, Bloodless Luna, which is a really good secondary attacking option. Some of them are even adding likes of a um, reset stamp into um, Gar Lost on Garatina to really have that disruptive capability. Think about that, plus an Iono, oh, sorry, yeah. Or, sorry, a counter catcher. So you've got two item cards and you've got a supported artist you can draw a chorus, which is insanely strong for um, Lost Teen. That can really help that disrupt the capability. Now, I know the new other stuff that will appear. We see the likes of Toho Iron Hands and the likes of um, Shen Pao do, in fact, make this sort of graphic, but they've definitely been a little bit fizzling out in the last um, few weeks. I purely think this is the case that um, Toho Iron Hands could be a little, little bit too slow against the likes of um, Nukia and um, Drag Hot, even though it does hit for. Pretty good weaknesses against each other one. And Shen Pao, I definitely feel like, was really, really strong in the early game. But think about how powerful Dragon Ball really is. They've kind of definitely favored out a little bit. If you're going to a testing for NEIC, definitely will see this is a really good graphic to exactly know what you should be testing. I think like so Dragon Ball, Lugia, Lostina, Charizard, and Mirage are definitely my top five decks and picks going into the format. And I think they're definitely the most strongest ones. And we can see that, but they really represent about 6% of the meta. So I think that's definitely a really, really good thing to show. I think some underdogs in this format right now, I would say, could be the likes of Gardevoir. Obviously, he did get a second place. And even the likes of um, the um, Raging Bolt, um, uh, there could actually be a other very good rogy sort of um, archetype underneath. But I do think the likes of Gardevoir could, in fact, pass it through because it's incredibly well placed. So let's actually break down from that past weekend exactly what were the top placing decks. But we can see here that Dragapult did get 17 wins, but only followed shortly by likes of Lost Teen again, 11 which is, again, very, very interesting to see. We've seen likes of Lost Tina do really well because I think Garatina has a very good response to likes of Dragapult. Obviously, has a lot of HP, so they have to two sh one hit, one hit, two hit KO you, but also Garatina can have that one hit KO potential ability for likes of adding a maximum belt if they go back that route, or in fact, even likes of that Lost and um, Star Requiem, which guarantees a one hit KO on it. Plus, you've got Greninja to take some KOs and GPs, even likes of Sableye's watch to spread some damage counters as well. Definitely something interesting to see. We've seen Moridon bump into the fact of getting that number four spot, purely on the basis, obviously, at one, and then a lot of people want to be trying out Moridon and definitely realize that actually Moridon is really, really good in Dragapult. So, and, and if Luke is really good as well, Moridon's good into that as well. So, why don't I just play Moridon? So, I definitely think that's a good inclusion. Gardevoir definitely stays the same at number fifth one, and Charizard is back in at number six. Um, so we are seeing Charizard still kind of show its face, but the numbers have definitely switched from the likes of Dragapult, which definitely, I would say, some people might really, really like, have, like switching from one BDF to another one. But I definitely think we're not in the, the case stages what Palkia, Arceus, and even likes of Lugia in a similar Tempest format really have become. We're definitely seeing a bit more variety in that format than we saw previously. So right now, let's break down exactly what are some of the top placing decks. What exactly do they look like? So if we look at Dragapult, and this is definitely a build which I'm quite a big fan of. This is obviously the one with the Zati build. We can see here they play a 4-3-3 line Dragapult, which could be a little bit thin. Some decks are definitely focusing on a 4-4-3 line. But when you've got such a powerful stage one Pokemon, like and draw cloak for extra draw factor, you obviously want to kind of capitalize that as much as possible. There are some other nice things as well, which are very similar to how we've seen the likes of um, Charizard. We've seen the Rotom, we've seen Heavy Arvin and Luminion, plus the Forest Seal Stone package. I really like this one because Rotom can get you, um, sorry, Rotom, oh, Luminion can easily get you from your draw factor, having likes to gain your Arvin. Then the Arvin can get you likes of the, um, the TM Evo, which can help you accelerate into getting your um, Dracloaks as well as also your Zartus, or even sometimes a Forest Seal Stone and Rare Candy package, which is a very, very good inclusion. Rest of it definitely focusing a lot more of consistency. I like the Rain Alakazam because that can help you hit some of the numbers you might potentially need to hit. If you've got some spread damage already on this one, you could spread potentially two damage from Pokemon you kind of did a level of damage to. Check it to the actor spot, for example, for like Mariah, and also you can get these big one hit KOs. The expect of choice is definitely the likes of Prime Catcher. We're definitely seeing that focus on a lot more in the Dragapult list. Not going for like the upper Neo energy, because you kind of go with, well, so after I can have the energy attached from that way, so it's kind of okay with. And that's one thing I really like about this, really focusing on having a much more powerful um, a spec and not relying on potential energy card, which can easily be discarded from the likes of Enhanced Hammer, which is definitely picking up quite a lot if Myth Energy is around. That's definitely an inclusion which could be added into Dragapult. I also love a TM Devo. I think TM Devo is a very, very nice inclusion. And obviously, the same choice in Temple of Snow to remove the fact that they cut the Miss Energy and not relying on likes of Enhanced Sound. I think this is a very, very clean, very, very aggressive Dragapult list, which I definitely will be testing out very soon. But the other one is this Charizard Bell, which is definitely a little bit more different to how we kind of expected to see. Now we can see here that they've opted to go to a 4-4-2 line of Dragapult and even a 2-1-2 line of Charizard. 
Well, again, some things you are noticing, they are playing the only HP Charmander. So definitely, if you've got that in the binder, bring it back out again, because that's going to be the most optimal one to play. Some other really interesting picks for this deck is the Radiant Serena and Scoop Up Cyclone. Radiant Serena, I think, is a nice one because I get that healing factor. Because I think that's definitely what this deck sometimes needs. Because if you're going to lose a mirror match, they can potentially take multiple um, prizes, get up the setups from get, moving some of the damage counts around. So getting that healing factor, it's really, really strong. And the Scoop Up Cyclone means you can reutilize any of your Charizards, or in fact, if you've got a very, very heavily damaged Dragapult, pick it back up and then pop it back down. I think that's something which is really, really good about this archetype. One thing as well, which is a bit different, they do play a high count of the Iron but they're still focusing on that um, Arvin package. I think that's definitely the best way to play. One thing you may notice, I'm not showing the likes of the Pidgeot, I'm not showing the likes of Blossom, because those builds haven't actually appeared that much. Those two builds which I've just shown you, the Zartu and Charis build, are the most common ones in Japan right now, and definitely the ones that are performing the best. I really like the Zartu one because I really love the TM Devo, whereas this one definitely packages quite a lot of stuff. I really like the Charis build, but I do think you might be a lot more reliant on the, against the likes of TM Devo, because only playing three rare candies effectively with four stage twos is definitely a little bit more of a struggle. But I would say definitely Dragon Ball is still a brand new archetype. We've only had the, it's out for nearly a, about a month. We've got about just under a month as well for a few weeks for any NAIC. So it's definitely a lot of room to improve and really see how Dragon Ball is going to adapt to it. Now let's look at Los Tina, some two dip builds as well. This is the build which I talked about a little bit earlier, having likes of an Unfair Stamp as well as even the likes of a Blood in a Saluna and Countercatcher. The reason why I love this one because you can chorus into a few cards, then also if your opponent's taking a knockout and it's, it could be, can be, even could be done in the early game, just get Unfair Stamp with them and even a Countercatcher in the late game could be absolutely devastating for them. They could, putting them down to a two card prize hand, if, and then maybe even getting a really good ninja play, getting rid of some confies if you're in a mirror match, and all of a sudden they could be dead out of the water, which I think is very much a stronger play for how then um, Lost Tina is adapting and evolving. It could be very different to the other build as well, which is, I would say, we're more commonly seen to this one. Big thing I'm noticing, they're going back to two Cramorants, they're not playing more only one Cramorant, so it's definitely something to be picking up to as well. Manaphy is definitely slipping back into the list because think about how powerful the likes of it. This deck has become a much more stronger one. Greninja's going to be in a lot of decks, so you want to definitely have that bench protection as much as possible. Another thing as well, which this list does in fact pay itself to play an Iona compared to the other one, because even having the Forest Hill Stone and the Prime Catcher, which I would say is definitely coming a bit more of a more common sort of theme for Lost Tina, but I absolutely love the, the very much destructive capability as this list, list really did have to offer by having the Unfair Stamp, because I think that card is absolutely incredible. And again, still playing Temple of Cinnamon Choice really didn't deny the missed energy from any of your opponent, because if Lucas is doing really, really well, you want to definitely deny them from having any access to their missed energy at all. And if we just talk about Lucas, let's look at how it is looking right now. We can see here they are opting to play the 70 HP ch um, ch 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 Chimchas? <laughs> um, Minchino, Sinchino. There we go, Minchino. I, definitely something which you are going to be seeing a lot of. Even though 60 HP is definitely the more optimal one to call for family, but the 70 HP one, you want the protection against Dragapult. If you're Lugia's one of the best decks, you definitely need to have that protection as much as possible. And then when we are seeing some of the new cards, we've seen like some jamming tower in this one, stopping any of these and very, very destructive tool cards from your opponent's side. Sometimes even denying the likes of his emergency board so they can't get their fear or tree, or in fact, if it's God of War, it's instantly kind of like get potentially one, maybe even two prize cards if they have these very heavily damaged Pokemon, which, which exceed the HP if they've got the any of that protection. Also denies them maximum belt so they can't get these big one hit kills on the likes of a... Um, Blowing us Luna, as well as also a Iron Hands. Definitely something to include, but another one I really like to see is we are seeing Kami pick up in a lot more lists right now. You can play it on your first turn of the game. If you do, discard your hand, draw five. I really like this one. I think we are seeing some decks play one, we're seeing some decks play five, but I think having the mini one, having that recycle capability of it from the likes of Legacy Energy, I think only playing one is definitely a, a stretch, maybe even two at times to guarantee you can draw into this much early on in the early game. The rest of this, I think, is very much a straightforward Lugia build, how we're seeing. I think Mist Energy is going to become a lot more of a mainstay, and you definitely notice the numbers are increasing from the likes of two to maybe even four in some decks. So they're that scale of Dragapult. Because <clears throat> you don't want to give them any free um, bench sniping capability, which definitely Lugia can really, really struggle against. <clears throat> So I would say it's definitely where I'm seeing Luca kind of build. We are still seeing the Bloody Nuts Luna because it's such a good um, colorless attacker and as much more prize your opponent takes, just energies that are required for this one, which is definitely a really, really nice one. 
Now let's look at Moraidon, two different builds about how we see Moraidon do really well. Obviously, it, it won the Champions League, and we are seeing it have that great success kind of replicate over the past weekend. Now, obviously, we know City Lisa kind of stopped. Gym Challenges are definitely going to pop their head back up again, and we'll get a new set ne next month as well. So we are going to see the format develop just a little bit. But Moraidon has definitely come into like disappeared for like a few months. I would say since the Paradox Rift format, it was appearing here and there, but not as strong. But definitely it's really propped back as not like ugly head, but definitely much, much stronger. Now, what builder here which makes it a lot better? I think Tatsuguri is a great inclusion into Maridon. Obviously, the emergency board, you can give it free retreat, and all of a sudden you get your Poke Gear. This deck always wants to get the support, it wants to get the turn one Arvid, or even sometimes um, the turn one Professor's. Um, but I say, press the second one, press the research if you're going second, because you want to be that very big, big draw factor. You want to utilize as many iron hands as possible. We're seeing a huge increase in energy, especially in the likes. We see here 19 energies, three double turbos, six enlightened energies. They want to get that iron hands out as much as possible, because they know how much of a threat that can really be in the rest of the meta game. So I would say that definitely that is the best way. Raichu definitely loses its feet as much a little bit because it purely, you can't have the flapping to chuck some energies onto this one. So you really have to rely on making sure they stick around. That's why I think Heavy Baton is such a good inclusion, because you're always going to be attacking with Iron Hands very early on. That's going to be your main sort of support of call. So then after spreading the energies after this one, if it gets to stay on, if it doesn't get lost vacuum, is a really good inclusion. I like Iron Bundle, because if you're playing Iron Hands, you want to force your, your opponent's going to always prefer two prize Pokemon in the action spot and force you to try and like, find a switching out, find that Prime Catcher, find that boss, find that Iron Bundle, try and get one of their, um, one price Pokemon to turn into two prices. So that's definitely something which I've noticed. Definitely playing the three, the heavy account on the Maridon, I think is actually okay. Pure on the basis you want to try and get these um, big one hit KOs and big setup as much as possible, which could be very different to this build as well. One big thing, big difference in this one is it doesn't play any Tatsuguri, but it does play the likes of Blood Luna as Luna. Now I really like this build. It's a little bit different to how we've seen the other one right now, where it's definitely a little bit less cards, less research, um, energy counts are still the same, but it does play the future booster energy capsule. Because also now um, Iron Hands can do hit that magic 280 damage if the opponent is weak to lightning. So it's um, the likes of Lukia and Pidgeot EX become these two prize, very big liability, sorry, three prize liabilities on the opponent's side. Blowing Luna is a very good secondary attacking option in one, and it can easily be energy accelerated in the late game, even if it has a heavy battle, which this list does not run. So I think this is definitely a little bit different in a way how Mirage is kind of being played, definitely focusing more on the aggressive sort of side a little bit, but I'm a big, big fan about where Mirage is kind of going with this one. Definitely my testing in Mirage has definitely been the most impressive deck, and I think it's a really, really good inclusion code into the new format. Now let's look at Gardevoir. Now, obviously, if you haven't watched it already, there's an amazing masterclass about how to really play Gardevoir, and it was very, very helpful over it as well. So thank you so much for those people who watched it, and welcome to the channel if you're brand new to this one. Now, this is a build very, very similar to Lizard that come second place, and there's a few differences to how well I've been showing as well. And I definitely want to give my thoughts and feelings about why that could be the case. Monkey Dory and Cresselia. I've realized now that they are very, very powerful inclusions. Monkey Dory makes sure that Gardevoir can hit 220 damage, which again, something that completely slipped my mind because I wasn't being testing the Monkey Dory build. I was testing more about what I was more comfortable with, with. And that's where I kind of like Monkey Dory definitely slipped a little bit. It's basically really acts about moving stuff from your side to the other side. This is definitely much stronger in likes of um, Dragapult and even likes of if you have to attach yourself to your Curlia to get that retreat option, you can easily kind of like move that energy out move that damage counter around. They make sure that some of those Tail and Drift Bloom don't need to have additional energy attached or some of even a modifier. One thing I also love about this one, it does play the likes of two um, Bravery Charm and one um, Luxury Escape. Three um, damage modifiers effectively, which I think is a very, very good inclusion and doesn't really sacrifice it. Cresselia, I'm still not absolutely sold on one. Again, if it likes to um, Dragapult, one of their ways to have a win is they spread loads of damage counters around to make sure you can't touch energy. So Cresselia is definitely a good answer in that sort of um, retrospect. I think this is a very, very interesting build, a very, very good way of how Gardevoir has kind of been evolving and adapting. You also mentioned there's no Klefki, but still having Fluxmane, because I think Fluxmane is so good, shutting off pretty much any single ability that is, in fact, an ancient one from the opponent's active side is a very, very nice inclusion. No Jirachi, because obviously it doesn't shut off Dragapult, and if Sableye isn't as strong as it once was, it's absolutely okay. But you can even add in a one with Ravskalite, because we are playing the team Evo. I think it's a like very, very powerful one of Gardevoir. The only thing I would definitely say is a little bit different is there's no Collapse Stadium, but they also play in the Churro plus the Power Pad. So you do have that reutability of utilizing um, Churro at least twice in the game, which I think is very, very strong. So yeah, Gardevoir is in a very, very good spot. And kind of like the last like big sort of top six deck is Charizard. And we can see here, it has changed 
quite a lot. And I'm going to talk to you exactly why I think this is a very, very good thing. We can obviously see the Charmanders have gone back to the 70 HP one, and the P Pidgey's gone to the less optimal 60 HP one, and Bidoof has gone to the 70 HP one, which obviously that was the very first one that was in the world champion winning list. But Let's talk about the big changes because it's very, very different to how we've seen before. We've seen two very key cards, and these two key cards really help you in the Dragon Ball match. I mean, it's the only reason why I think Charles can actually keep up. Well, obviously, we see Miss Energy, which is a good inclusion, but we see Maxim Belt and Kieran. Now, you might go, Charlie, why on earth are these two cards in this list? Can you at least explain it? Plus, there's also that supporter as well, which I have um, that teacher. But let me talk to you about the Maxim Belt and Kieran. Against Dragon Ball, you can do additional 80 more damage. That's insanely very, very powerful. Think about it now, if your opponent doesn't take any KOs or prizes, your Charles is doing a base damage against any um, EX Pokemon of at least 150 damage, I believe. No, 80 damage, 100, 260 damage, which is very, very strong. So what's on the Dragapult may take two prize cards, maybe even three, you can get these big one hit capability, not rely on your opponent taking at least five prizes before that happens. So that's another good thing, it helps with the racing. Plus you also play that brand new a supporter from, I believe it is the um, Parallel Twist format, which lets you heal 50 damage from two of your bench Pokemon. Again, or I think it's two of your any Pokemon. Again, very, very helpful against Dragapult. If you're playing Pidgeot, it's an easy way to search it out for this one. And even like the Vitality Band helps you do a little bit more damage against Dragapult. This, and always even more importantly, gets a one hit KO against their opposing Rotoms. So you can see here, there are some very, very key cards in this one. We obviously play Temple of Sinnoh, but be very careful when you play this one because obviously you don't want to shut off your own Mist Energy. But Mist Energy obviously is a very, very good, helpful card against your, your the likes of your opponent's um, Dragapults. So these are some very, very interesting picks about how Charles has adapted. High HP Charmanders, and even going back to Maximum Bell, not to kind of have like a Bear Shin Power matchup, but to really help you in the in the um, Dragapult matchup, and even some like the Mirror match as well. Do an additional 80 more damage, it's really, really strong, and definitely can surprise your opponent in certain ways. So that's exactly how Charles has this build. Let's look at some fun decks that actually be performing very, very well, and actually I think could do really well as some um, rogue contenders. And obviously Raging Bolt is one of them. And you may look at this and go, Charlie, where do I begin? Well, obviously, Raging Bolt is definitely kind of like known as factor. It's kind of like a meme deck. I played against an EOIC, and definitely it's interesting. 70 times the amount of basic energy you discard to all your Pokemon in play. Lots of people teamed up with the likes of Sandy Shocks because they want to take your opponent takes two prize cards. It means its ability gets unlocked. We get to attach a basic and fighting energy for your disc power to this one. But now Ogre Pond is released with an amazing ability, which is to attach one grass energy from your hand to Ogre Pond. And if you do, draw a card. All of a sudden, you have a drawing effect of plus energy acceleration. This is very, very powerful. If you have the whole thing set up, potentially a Raging Bolt, you can even get Fresh Asylum set up and your three Ogre Ponds, you effectively potentially could attach, well, one energy for turn, two energies from Sada, one energy from Sandy Shocks, and three from Ogre Pond. You're effectively then attaching seven energies per turn, potentially as soon as your opponent's taken two prize cards. This becomes very, very scary for your opponent to deal with. Plus, with Ogapon, we use a very good secondary attacking option. Just set it up with just a little bit more energy acceleration every time. And also, they put your Charizard answer right then and there, which I think could be very scary for them. We've seen the likes of that new Bug Catcher, which lets you get any Grass Energy or um, Grass Pokemon from the top of your deck and add them to your hand, which is another very good inclusion. We've seen the likes of Pokestop because you want to draw be very aggressive. We've seen the likes of Energy Retriever to get the energy back from the discard pile. There are so many interesting things about this archetype. And I've seen it in action. It is very scary when it actually gets set up. You could it's not, it's no real threat that potentially turn two, maybe in turn three, you'll constantly streamline the attack is turn after turn after turn. Discard these seven to sorry five to six energies every single turn and constantly re re renewing them. That's why this deck is so scary and actually such a fun deck to kind of see and play. Yes, I would love to see another energy retrieval so you can get more of these grass energies back, but this deck here, I'm very, very happy with this one. It's a very, very fun deck and definitely something which I should be testing as a fun rogue archetype. Lost Box definitely has had a little bit of a change, but didn't gain too many things from the likes of um, the Twilight Masquerade format. We're still seeing here the Blood in the Saluna as the best card of choice. This one here isn't running the likes of Iron Hands or even the likes of Warring Moon, which is definitely seen the Power Box as the best way to play Lost Box. So I definitely think this is a more of an interesting build to play. I like Iron Bundle, it's definitely been in so many more archetypes now. I think this deck, this card has really kind of like had its shiny moment. I would say it definitely wasn't as powerful when I first saw Iron Bundle, but it's nearly every other deck. And I'm a huge, huge fan of this Iron Bundle right now. Just having that instant gusting effect, 
potentially have an escape with. It just shows how important that card really was in the past format. I definitely would say a lot of rocks can really struggle if we've got this huge increase in Dragapult. They can constantly pick up lots of these sort of stuff on the bench and everything like that. But I would say that Lost Box is still in a kind of okay sort of place going into new format, but again, only really gain a Blood Nurse Luna, which is a really good secondary attacking option in the late game. Control that build did gain a few really cool key cards. The Flute. The Flute basically looks at the top five cards of your opponent's deck and put any basic Pokemon on there onto their bench. Now this can be helpful because you can stop the likes of a Luminion, stop any of their, if they have any big support Pokemon which have an instant play effect, or in fact they don't want to play at all, they can really be, you can really punish your opponent by at benching them without their kind of like, without their consent, which is definitely the best way how this set works. <clears throat> Also, the fan. The fan is such a powerful tool card. If it's attached to one of your Pokemon, and if one of your opponent's Pokemon attacks into this one, you may move one energy from that Pokemon to one of their bench. Again, you might potentially spread it to a Pokemon that doesn't even need it. For example, in Charizard, the fire energy to Rotom. All of a sudden, they've wasted their way, and now it's completely gone, and they can't use this one. I've definitely noticed the way how they love to play Control in Japan is the Block Clax version, whereas the say definitely for us, and obviously we saw us all do very, very well with the um, Pidgeot build as well which I would say is definitely the best way to play it. I believe you did play a Pidgeot build, although I didn't in fact um, check recently, so it might in fact be a Block Clax. But I've definitely noticed that as the more preferred to play in Japan is Block Clax, whereas say for us, it's definitely more of the Pidgeot build right now. Also, I still love the Chiyu because they can really help in the mirror match. And also if you get really of your resources out, you can win from Deco, which I would say is a very, very good strategy. Control definitely is still viable in the next format. And I would definitely say it could struggle just a little bit against Dragapult, because obviously Dragapult can hit 200 damage, and they can get these big one-hit kills and snipes if they even have a bravery charm attached to it. Blessy as well is a very nice fun deck, which actually did get a few wins. So well done, Blessy. Um, having 300 HP on a stage one is definitely very much a scary sort of factor. I love the Monkey Dory to move some engines around this one. And also Blessy has that protection. And the actually has a nice attacking op a secondary attacking option, having the likes of Palkia. Now, obviously, it could be a bit scary if Mirage doing incredibly well. Um, Palkia can definitely be that bit of a liability by being weak to lightning. But having the Pokemon come out of nowhere hit for 260 damage is really, really good. I also love it. It also plays the fan as well. Track a fan on Blessy, move around some of your opponent's energies. It's very, very scary for them to really deal with it. Having also two Monkey Dories out in play could, in fact, be really good. You can, like, energy, move, you can energy accelerate with Palkia. You can move around the energies. It's just really, really good and really, really powerful. And I absolutely love this one. Check a cape this one to 400 HP. could be very, very difficult for any of your opponents to deal with this one. And it definitely is more of a lock sort of style thing with the Cheren, with the Professor Chiro scenario, and even Palpat as well. I think this is a fun way, potentially a control way, but you can also do some attacking options as well. Definitely an interesting one to keep on the radar. And Greninja as well. Definitely, I made a mistake last time with Frost Slash. It's definitely anything with an ability out in play, except Frost Slash. You put some damage counters on, which is actually what makes Greninja so much more viable. And I've seen it do really well in action. And definitely, this is the more preferred way of how it is actually, in fact, played. Now, obviously, we know Grinch is one of the best attacks right now in the game for water energy, 100 damage to get any one card from your hand and pop it into your deck. People thought, oh, I'm instantly pairing it with Pidgeot because also it's basically Charizard, but you can get anything. Uh, no, I think Frothas is an amazing partner because, effectively, if you have three of these out, all three of them out and play, you could do additional 60 more damage per going in and out of your turn, which is really, really scary for them to deal with at all. I love the um, Halucha as well. I think this can really swing the likes of their Lukia matchup. Or suddenly you can spread lots of damage out and play, then they can easily punish them by doing that 100 damage to both of your opponent's Archaeopters. And it can easily be one hit KO going into your turn or going out of a turn, which is definitely a much more of a scarier threat. The Enhanced Hammer to remove any of these um, very pesky sort of um, energy cards as well, if you like some Legacy, which is definitely really good. Also, the Hyper Aroma was seen here because if you're playing Frostlass and if you can even play a high count of Frogadier, try and get any of the, your, these um, Stage 1 Pokemon out and play. I also really like Spot Account as well. That definitely focus more on the Irida because you play a lot more water Pokemon. So you can instantly guarantee a rare candy if you're a frog. They also even get your um the um the hyper blower, hyper aroma, which is then nice inclusion as well. Greninja is definitely going to be up there. I think it's definitely gone from meta to rogue, even though it is appearing in loads of the um factors, but it's not performing as well as I once thought it would do. And I think Greninja is going to be potentially well placed going into this new format. So now if we look ahead, going into this new format as well, what can we really take around front? Is Mirage on the answer to Dragapult? 
I would definitely argue the fact that potentially it could be. Rhino is such a powerful attacking option, such an amazing toolbox sort of deck here, and it has so many answers for likes of Dragapult. Will this meta actually, will the meta actually affect us? If we look at how Japan's meta has really always affected us as well, we can see here we definitely deviate in a few sort of counts of certain cards, but we can definitely see it definitely is very similar. We've seen Charizard really, really dominate in Japan first, dominate in our regionals, and now we've seen Dragon Ball dominate in Japan. Could we see that be the case in dominating our regionals and NAIC and even in Worlds in a few months time or in a few weeks? I could potentially see that be the case. And we're always such a good learning place, looking at how the meta is kind of evolving first of all and see if we have any answers for this one. And more importantly, can we see Charizard's numbers return? Charizard obviously went from being the F tier deck to now gone to like a B tier deck. Could Charizard actually have this come back? Potentially, I could definitely see Charizard do really well, but it needs so much more changing. We've seen the Maxim Bell, the Kirin, but that in fact can only work like once or twice in a game, but that only even like sometimes the mid slate game. So it's definitely starting to be a bit more of a struggle what, where Charizard can really fade around. So hope you guys have enjoyed this looking ahead video. If you have, please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below what deck are you excited to try in the Twilight Masquerade format. I'm going to be back hopefully in a few days with a deck profile. If not, I hope to be back next week with my top rogue picks and obviously my top. Um, strongest picks in the Twilight Masquerade format. Till then, bye for now.